To our veterans, uh, we say thank you for your service. And to those of you who uh, are loved ones of veterans who have been lost uh, in service, we say thank you to you as well. Um, one of our own has recently gone into the military, and um, we have many other loved ones who have been in the military already for a while. And uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day when we remember those who, uh, who gave their lives, made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom and for the interests of our countries. And it made me think about loss, made me think about people who are struggling with grief, people who are struggling with loneliness. And the Bible has good news for those who are lonely. That's what I want us to talk about for a few minutes this morning. It's what it's like to be lonely. Because when you lose a loved one, there's that feeling that many times persists for years and years and years of not having somebody that you feel like you're supposed to have. Loneliness takes a lot of other forms. It also happens, of course, when your children leave, when they go to school or move out of the house or whatever the case may be. Your children also feel lonely when you move to a new place and you don't know anybody when you go off to school for the first time. A lot of different ways that people feel loneliness. But we've been talking for the last few weeks about why the gospel is called the good news. And it's certainly called the good news because of its message of forgiveness and eternal life. But it also has implications that are good news for people who are struggling with other things. The Bible is also good news for people who are struggling with things like loneliness. Part of that good news is that Jesus understands loneliness. He understands our feelings. He understands our emotions. And you see that very clearly here in Matthew chapter 26. I appreciate Brother Vance reading this passage. If you look at what he says here in verse 37, he takes Peter and the sons of Zebedee. The sons of Zebedee are James and John. So he, he's got 11 of his 12 apostles in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is the, the place of, a, of an olive press. So this is likely an olive grove. It's a garden probably with a fence around it. And there's an olive press probably deep into the garden. And he leaves eight of the 11 apostles who are with him close to the front of the garden. And he takes three of his apostles, Peter, James, and John, deeper into the garden. Evidently further away from the gate. And he says to them, you wait here. But look at how he's described in verse 37. Begin to be grieved and distressed. Jesus felt deep, deep, emotion. These emotions are not identified for us. We can't know for certain, but we can certainly imagine how we would feel in a similar situation. Almost certainly his emotions include things like dread. Dread of horrific physical pain. He's already been preparing his apostles for his death. And so he's apparently feeling some sort of anxiety over what's going to happen to his apostles. That very night, he's prophesied to his apostles, you're all going to scatter. He's prophesied to Peter, you're going to deny me three times. This is on his mind. And how does it make him feel? Grieved and distressed. And so what is he looking for? He's looking for some comfort from other people. He's looking for a little bit of help from his closest companions. 
I'm deeply grieved and distressed. Verse 38, he says, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. I feel like I'm about to die. And he is about to die, but he feels like he's at the point of death emotionally. Deeply grieved. And what does he want? Remain here and keep watch. I need you to do one thing for me. I need you to, I need you to give me some, some protection while I pray. That's all I want. I just keep watch, be close to me, be within earshot so that I can pray in peace. That's all I need from you. And what do they do? Verse 40, He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. What does He say? So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. You couldn't do this one thing I asked you to do. I didn't ask Vance to keep reading. But if you come down in verse 41, He says, keep watching and praying. So He says to them a second time, watch and pray for me. Just watch, just stay awake and pray for me. And pay attention because there's a troop coming to get me. Verse 42, he goes away again. Verse 43, again he came and found them sleeping. Verse 44, he left them again. Apparently the second time he finds them asleep, he just leaves them asleep. I ask you twice. You can't do it. How do you think he felt? Alone. Alone. He's got his friends there with him, but they're no help to him. Verse 44, he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Verse 45, he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? I have to do this all by myself. He's lonely. He's under great emotional distress and he's not getting any help from his closest companions. The people that he wanted to rely on. God comforted Jesus. It's not recorded in Matthew, but in Luke 24, verse 61, uh, verse 4, Luke 22, verse 43, says, Now an angel from heaven appeared to him. Strengthen him. Two lessons. Number one, Jesus knows. He knows what it feels like. And because He knows what it feels like, you may feel alone, but you're not alone. You may think no one understands, but He understands. And number two, God cares. And He provides strength. Peter, James, John, the other eight apostles, they didn't provide strength. They didn't make His position better. They didn't alleviate His stress. But God did. God did. The Father sent an angel to strengthen Him because He needed it. Of course, then it gets worse. After the Roman troops and the servants of the high priest come, Peter takes a swing, hits one of them, cuts off his ear, but then all the disciples flee. Matthew 26, verse 56, Then all the disciples left him and fled. And then, of course, Peter and John come to the house of the high priest where Jesus is on trial and being tortured at the same time. They're torturing him during his trial. Peter denies him three times. Jesus knows it. In Luke 22, verse 61, it says, The Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, Before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. Why did Jesus turn and look Peter in the eye right after Peter denied him the third time? Because he felt it. He felt abandoned. He felt alone. 
He's lonely. And it makes it worse. It makes it worse. Sometimes you're lonely because you don't have close friends. Because you don't have close companions. Sometimes it's because your social scene has changed. Sometimes it's because you had a baby and none of your friends have had babies. Sometimes all your friends have had babies and you hadn't had a baby. And so it's just, everything's just different. And you, Where did my group go? Or all your friends went to one school and you went to it. You feel lonely. People move away. You lose those relationships. Or sometimes you're like Jesus. And you have close friends, but you can't trust them. They're not there for you when you need them the most. And when you need them the most, you feel the loneliest. Jesus offers solace. Do you know what the book of Matthew closes with? After Jesus is resurrected, He's appeared to the apostles multiple times. He appears to them on the Sea of Galilee. Matthew closes his book with the Great Commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to all creation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And what's the last thing he says? Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Jesus said, you abandoned me. You left me alone in my time of greatest distress. I will not abandon you. I will be there for you. John 14, verse 18, He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will be with you. I will come to you. Not only does He know what it feels like, which means you're not alone and you're not in the position that you feel that nobody understands because He understands. He also offers you comfort. He also offers you community. I want to look at another example of loneliness. Go with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we have a different kind of loneliness. It's the loneliness of being excluded. The loneliness of not being cared about. The apostles cared about Jesus. They just weren't... Who knows why they couldn't give Him what He needed, but they didn't. I'm sure they wanted to. And later, undoubtedly, they grew and would have been able to. John chapter 4, we have the woman at the well. Jesus is in Samaria, a city called Sychar, near Jacob's well. And he gets there in verse um, 6, tells us it was about the sixth hour. Using Jewish time, this would be noon, middle of the day. If they're using Roman time, it'd be six in the evening. Um, so that would be uh, right at dinner time. Either one of those times. It's probably noon. But even if it's evening, people are not going to the town well to get water. The women came to the town well to get water in the morning. And they used the water for cleaning, they used the water for cooking, they used the water for all their household chores, and they had enough water at the end of the day to fix supper. That's when they came to get it. They came in the morning and they got enough for all day. This woman comes at noon or in the evening. Why does she come at that time of day? Because she doesn't want to be with the other women. She doesn't want to be where they are. Why is that? Well, we learn once Jesus starts talking to her, you come down um, to verse 16, He says, Go and call your husband. She says, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. The one whom you now have is not your husband. That you have said truly. 
Jesus goes right to the heart of her pain. He goes right to the heart of her embarrassment. And He offers her a great gift. He reveals to her that He is the Messiah. One of the few times where Jesus says, I am the anointed one. I am the prophesied one. I am the Savior of Israel. Says it to this woman, this outcast, ostracized, half-breed woman who's an outcast of outcasts. The Samaritans are outcasts from the Jews, and this woman is an outcast from the Samaritans. You think she's not lonely? Maybe that explains why she's had so many bad relationships. She's left out. She's pushed out. She's disliked. Sometimes you feel lonely because you think nobody else is like you. And sometimes in your situation, you're pretty close to right. They don't like the same things you like. They don't want to do the things you do. They don't read the things you want to read. They don't play the games you want to play. They don't have the conversations you want to have. They don't eat the food you want to eat. Especially if you move to a new place. If you move across the country, you move to a different country. Very, very likely. But some children grow up in one place and they feel that through school. And it's a danger. Sometimes it pushes them off into sinful behavior because they think by engaging in this sinful behavior they can find their group. They can find a group of people to whom they can belong. Psalm 68 verse 5 talking about God says, A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in His holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. If you feel different, if you are different, if you have different tastes and different talents and different likes and dislikes, God has a place for you. God has a home for you. If you, don't, if you have lost those who should be closest to you, if they've rejected you and abandoned you, God has a home for you. The only people who stay in that condition, the only people who stay out there by themselves, misunderstood and unloved, the rebellious. The rebellious dwell in a parched land, but the one who comes to God, the one who entrusts his life to God, gets a home, a family, people who love him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This woman at the well in Samaria, is she a sinner? Yes. Did Jesus sympathize with her weaknesses? Yes. Did He offer her mercy and grace? Yes. Can He sympathize with your weaknesses, with your loneliness? Yes. Does He offer you mercy and grace? Yes. That's good news. Amen. That is good news. No matter how you feel. The last example of loneliness I want us to look at is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 shows us the Apostle Paul, and he's lonely even though he is a committed Christian with lots of Christians who love him. Even though he has been a missionary and a zealous apostle for Christ, he's not immune to loneliness. 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 6, he says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul says, I'm about to die. And he's in prison. 
The Bible is not absolutely clear, but trying to put the timeline of the Bible together, more than likely Paul is in the prison for the second time. The book of Acts records a long prison uh, experience for Paul that goes from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. But then other things indicate that Paul was likely released, and so 2 Timothy would indicate that Paul was then rearrested and was not released, but was killed and put to death the second time. More than likely that's the case, but the Bible is not clear on that. But Paul is in prison, and he is certain, he believes strongly in any way, that he's going to be put to death. That his execution is near. And so he says, the time of my departure has come. You come down to verse 6, no, um, to verse 9. Sorry, that nine was too small for me to see. Um, He says, make every effort to come to me soon. Talking to Timothy. Timothy, come as quick as you can. Why? For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. What's on Paul's mind? The people who aren't there. At least one of whom does not have a good excuse. At least one of whom does, because he sent one of them. But he says, only Luke is with me. He says, pick up Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me for service. Timothy, I want you to come And I want you to bring Mark. I need you here with me. He's in a jail cell. Look at what else he says. Verse 13. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas and Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Paul says, I'm cold. I want my coat. Can you bring my coat? He's writing a letter probably to a different continent saying, bring my coat. Can you hear the misery in that? He doesn't have anybody there who can get him a coat. Is Luke in prison too? Maybe. Maybe. But he's by himself. And he's he's frustrated at the people who've left him, at least one of them. And he wants Timothy to come, and he wants his books, and he wants his coat. He's lonely. He feels abandoned and rejected. If you don't have any family near, sometimes you feel like nobody cares about you. Everybody wants to feel cared about. Everybody wants to feel desired. People who care when you get sick. People who care when you're hurting. People who want to know if you're moving forward to something good. Especially true when you've lost a loved one. Psalm 38, verse 11. David says, My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague. My kinsmen stand afar off. David knew loneliness too. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus makes us a promise. He says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother, or father, or children, or farms, for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farmers and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. God says, when you give your life to him, When you live a life of faith, you're going to suffer loss. You're going to lose relationships. You're going to have people who don't like you. You're going to have people who exclude you, people who ostracize you, people who treat you badly. But if you commit your life to Christ, God will replace it. And not just in heaven, He'll replace it here. You'll receive a hundred times as much. There's only one way for that to make sense. There's only one way that that's true in our experience. And that's the church. He has got to be talking to the church. And that is a message for the church. 
when we have a brother or sister who is lonely, when we have a brother or sister who has lost, we are the makeup. We are God's promise to them. And we better be fulfilling that promise. Hebrews 13, verse 5. He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You know what that means? It means God is with you. And it means as the church, the body of Christ, we're supposed to be with you. The church is supposed to be filling a big part of that role. In the presence of God and the blessings of God in people's lives who have lost, who feel alone, who feel excluded, who feel left out who feel like nobody cares, nobody understands. We should be the proof that those feelings are not true. That those thoughts are incorrect. If we're not fulfilling our role, we're breaking God's promise. Finally, I want to leave you with one truth from Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. says, What shall we say to these things. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also freely give us all things? Here's the implication of that verse. When you feel alone, when you feel like nobody cares, when you feel like nobody is concerned about you, here's the truth. Jesus, God the Father, gave Jesus the Son for you. Jesus gave Himself for you. God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son for you. You are loved. You are wanted. And you are understood. Believe that because it's true. And if you know somebody who feels that way, prove to them that they're not alone and they're not misunderstood. If you are outside of Christ, if you don't enjoy the grace and the mercy that's available to those in the body of Christ, it's free to you right now. God has made it free to you, but we don't know how long His offer will stay open. So don't wait any longer. If you need to come to Christ for the first time to put Him on in baptism, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.